This is Hemet. And Jessica. And you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash Friendly Atheist Podcast to support this show. And you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, a listener, Marquis, um, who reached out to me a couple weeks ago and s- just sent me a lot of money for because I was going through a hard time. And I just wanted to thank him because I was able to get my broken computer fixed. Um, and he asked specifically that we spend money on Dottie, and she got a dope new bed from Costco, and That's it just lovely. kind of was, it just saved my ass, honestly, and I couldn't believe it. I genuinely thought it was a scam. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was just exactly what needed to happen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, anyway, thank you so much. You guys are just outrageously generous. Our with, listeners are awesome. With us and... It's weird because we're just two dum dums <laughs> sit in my <laughs> kitchen and try to ignore the dog. I don't know. Lovely. Uh, thank you. It was yeah, it was a game changer. So, so. today, let us begin um, by talking about this article that was in the Atlantic. Okay. Um, it's by John Fia, who is a professor of American history at a Christian university, Messiah University. Mm-hmm. He's a historian. He's written. He's not like a pro-Trump MAGA type of Christian. Okay. He's just a guy who's a Christian, and he's <laughs> been critical Generic of the Christian. Trumpism of evangelical Christianity. At the same time, if you read his website, he's more sympathetic than I think he should be of a lot of other evangelicals. Like, he okay. gives them more benefits of the doubt than he should. And so here's kind of the question that he was writing about this time. Are we being unfair to white evangelical Christians no. by focusing primarily on people like Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, David Barton, the Christian pseudo-historian, uh, people like James Dobson, who doesn't get in the news as much nowadays, but back in the day really promoted this sort of patriarchal, whip your kids, get them uh, in line, sure, sure, sure. that sort of thing. They get an outsized amount of media attention and from attention from people like me. I would argue that's for good reason. They yeah. have a lot of clout. Yeah. They have a lot of influence, not just among Christians in general, evangelical specifically, but with politicians and civic leaders and people like that. And what John Fia was writing in The Atlantic, the headline is, What I Wish More People Knew About American Evangelicalism. And the subtitle is, or the whatever you want to call this, For all the bad that comes out of this movement, there are still countless stories of personal transformation leading people to live better lives. I mean, yeah. Of course. <laughs> no, yeah, dog. Nobody nobody doubted that. Also, I bet there were some Nazis who were nice to their dogs. Not that it's the same <laughs> thing, but like, yeah, we know. And we know that because there's a huge-ass propaganda wing attached to the evangelical right that is telling mm. us this shit all of the time. You are way ahead of me. Yes, that is exactly Sorry, right. smarter than you, have it. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. He's basically saying if you look at all the books that have come out about evangelical Christianity, a lot of the articles about all this... Uh, they're very critical of evangelicals. And he says, back in 2018 in The Atlantic, I took my fellow evangelicals to task for their support of Donald Trump. Um, And he's right about that. He did. He's been critical of the way Trump surrounded himself by Christians Mm -hmm. who were clearly not interested in Jesus, but political power. So what he says in the article is, but the story of American evangelicalism isn't all negative, not in my dad's era, not in ours. And then he spends a lot of time talking about James Dobson specifically. And this is where it gets weird for me. Why is this name that's not connecting with me? Oh, Dobson sounds familiar, but it's not not up there in the echelon to me. Basically, if I I think of... I could just be young. That might be it. And you weren't raised in that environment. Yeah. But he was the... You know, like Dr. Spock is like the name people associate with parenting, how to raise your kids, something like that. Dr. Spock? Not the Star Trek dude, a different dude. Then obviously I don't know what we're talking about. I don't have kids. (laughs) You don't need kids. You just have to know. You don't... You don't beat your kids. Oh, yeah, James Dobson's That one I did get by myself. here's what you have heard of. From Dr. Spock. To train up a child. Sure, sure, sure. Train up a child. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, That whole book... Uh, Michael and Debbie Pearl, that book is about like, no, it's cool to hit your kids. Okay, gotcha. You, just, you I, don't you don't hit them so it leaves a mark. No. You hit them so they're afraid of you. Yeah. That sort of messed up mindset. Here's what he says about James Dobson, basically. Um, he says that his dad took that stuff pretty seriously, 
he listened to James Dobson. The Raise Up the Child stuff? No. Oh. Different, uh, same genre, different books. Oh, gotcha. But he said, my father didn't need James Dobson to teach him how to become a patriarch. He was a patriarch years before he picked up a copy of Dobson's Dare to Discipline. James Dobson founded Focus on the Family. That was that guy's (gasps) thing. Sure. Um, Or he had a radio, a bunch of radio shows. My father, John Fia writes, my father took to heart Dobson's lessons that as the male head of the household, he had the responsibility to lead the family with love and compassion. Um, I'm and skipping over violence, some of this stuff. I guess. <laughs> well, w- during my teenage years, when my little sister came along, my parents made sure she was raised in an evangelical household. It was a completely different upbringing from the one I had experienced, defined by Christian love, tender-hearted, and a father committed to the spiritual health of his family. In short, what Fia is writing is when he was growing up, before his father found James Dobson, mm. he was kind of a dick. By the time his sister came along years later, uh, his father had started reading James Dobson. And he, he says his father was committed to the spiritual health of the family. For all this, uh, a part of me will always be grateful for James Dobson's life and ministry. Because basically his father became a better father as a result of reading those books. And so he's saying, he says later, for all the bad that's come out of this movement, there are still countless stories of personal transformation leading people to become better parents, better spouses, and better members of their communities. Seeing the good in evangelicalism is essential to understanding its appeal to millions of Americans. Then he goes on to say, Yet, for all their value, books such as Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Cobus Dume mm. and Beth Allison Barr's book, who also wrote critically of evangelical Christianity, as works of evangelical history are woefully flat and do not explain historically the story of my father and, I imagine, millions of other men and women who learned from Dobson how to love their families as Jesus loves his church. So that's the crux of this article. That's a dumb argument. That is a that's very, a very bad argument. pointless argument, dog. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking so about? Why? Why You're is that bad? Missing the point by a goddamn country and mile. I, I have more to say, but we, why is that missing the point? Oh boy, God! Where, how is it even connecting to any kind of point? Like ever? Oh boy, who? gives a shit if your dad was a better dad because he read a stupid fucking book. Jesus Christ, dude. Like, these people are going out of their way to promote deeply harmful and awful policies that target underprivileged people and, like, and and, and the queer community is in fear because of people like this man who think that all of their, like, cutesy, oh, my dad was so nice to me after he read this book thing is enough cover to be like, yeah, and because I feel good about my dad, uh, I can freely shit all over minority uh, minority citizens of this country, and that's what we're going to use our social capital on. So, like, frankly, who gives a shit if that's nice? Like, I don't care. I don't give a shit. I know a lot of people who like became vegetarian and are super happy about it. Good, great. I don't give a shit. Do whatever you have to do to make yourself happy. I take this personally. But don't, <laughs> but don't act like having a nice, a quote unquote nice family dynamic, which lets, like even putting aside that, that a patriarchal upbringing fucking sucks, even putting that aside, who gives a shit if there are nice people when the entire thing exists as a weapon against others? I don't give a shit how nice church makes you feel. Guess what? Music rules, and it makes people feel real good. That's what happens at church. Like, you you go to a mega church, and you hear... Have you ever been to a concert? It's amazing. Of course you feel good after you go to a mega church. But who gives a shit when you are using every ounce of your considerable political might and will to harm many other people? Yeah. If you need to learn how to love your family from a man, Dobson specifically, who's still alive, though he's... Is uh, he? He is, somehow. Yeah, uh, he I- just... Pickles, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, him and Pat Robertson, man. Truly. Uh, if you need and to learn how Kissinger. to... <laughs> Way too long for that one. Way too long. If you need to learn how to love your family from someone whose idea of love involves hitting your kids, lying about gay people, Mm. promoting violence Mm -hmm. against trans people, which he has said, not directly, but indirectly, 
then your life is already fucked up. Like, if some of those parents turn out to be decent, it's only because they didn't listen to all of his Because some people advice. are just good parents naturally. Yeah, like, and by the way, that includes Fia himself, because here he is describing his own parenting style in the same article. When it came to our two daughters, now well-adjusted adults, oh, my, yeah. wife, my wife and I did not take James Dobson's approach to child rearing. There were no purity balls or regular spankings to protect their salvation, nor did we listen to much of his marriage advice, especially as it related to male headship and female submission. We have found other Christian approaches to marriage and family more helpful and perhaps less harmful. Which well, is what? great. What? I know. Less harmful. Less harmful. So you're saying that there's definitely harm in this. And and I'm I was waiting. Like, tell me more about the harm, the harm. you and believe his methods cause. So if evangelicals are so good, but you're saying you don't take most of his advice because it's bad and harmful. Right. Just because some people found you? value in James Dobson's overarching principles does not mean any of it is worth admiring. Yeah. People like truly people find inspiration in everything have you ever met a goth person like they didn't know what to do with their lives before nightmare before christmas came out <laughs> like everybody finds their inspo wherever they want to and that's fine but let's not pretend that that is like the key to a capital g good family yeah he writes that we need a fuller account of christian life rather than what he seems to think is this one-sided anti-evangelical argument we tend to see in popular books and articles the problem with that argument and this is what you were referring to is that the typical white evangelical Christian these days holds so many beliefs that are, like, objectively abominable. Mm -hmm. We are not unfairly focusing on a few bad apples. We are correctly pointing out that the entire orchard is rotten. Mm -hmm. um, and just because you might find one good apple in the bunch or a few of them, it doesn't negate the overall thing. And, in fact, look at how Fia spins all this in the conclusion of his article. He's talking about those books that were critical of Christianity. Those books are part of a narrative perpetuated by scholars, memoirists, and journalists that evangelicalism is bad for America. Christian nationalism, white supremacy, and sexual abuse have given the good news, in quotes, of the gospel a bad name. Some of this criticism is necessary, but some of it is unfair or disproportionate. <laughs> journalists, hang on, I'm almost done. I know. Journalists don't sufficiently distinguish Christian nationalists from conservative evangelicals who simply and reasonably want to bring their faith to bear on public life. Yikes <laughs> on bikes. There was literally nothing in that that was good or substantial or justified the writing of this piece of shit. I want to I want to repeat what that a last bit coward. there. That what last a coward. bit. Coward. Journalists don't distinguish Christian nationalists who he says, yeah, we should totally criticize them. Who are the Christian nationalists, sir? Because yes. they don't self-identify. Well, sometimes they do. <laughs> sometimes They're they getting do. to because Marjorie they Marjorie Taylor um, Greene is right. like, yeah, I am a Christian nationalist. Like, what the fuck? Are <gasps> but wait, journalists don't sufficiently distinguish Christian nationalists from conservative evangelicals who simply and reasonably want to bring their faith to bear on public life. What bring does that mean? Bring their faith to bear on public life? Here is what Sir, that means. Sir, listen to yourself. <laughs> this is, doesn't have an editor? <laughs> the Atlantic doesn't hire there them anymore. There have to be it's people in his life that are like, college campuses and Christians Sir, are good. That is the Sir, Atlantic now. you certainly cannot say bring your religion to bear on public life because that's saying the quiet part out loud. Like, when your entire magazine is promoted to being a contrarian, all they write about now is like, let me tell you what one college student said yesterday and how that's a trend. Sorry, Let's this is go. so embarrassing for genuinely everybody <laughs> who is involved in everything. For what it's worth, you could say that about many pieces in the same magazine. Now, Do we not like but, the Atlantic? Uh, we don't like half the Atlantic. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, but here's what that means. What does it mean to bring your faith on public life? Like for, We're watching it, haven't. <laughs> separately from what he says are the problematic Christian nationalists. And only the good Christian nationalists are, are trying to bring their religion to fruition, right? right only right, the right. good ones. Don't worry here's about what, the Christian nationalists. Here's what the good ones are doing. Fucking Okay, idiot. I will tell you what the good ones are doing. Preventing women from accessing reproductive health care. Check. Falsely telling gay kids they can change their sexual orientation. And should. Denying trans kids access to tools that will help them grow up into adults. Or their existence. Uh-huh. Rejecting expertise in science and medicine in lieu of conspiracy theories. 
pushing harmful myths about sex in the name of purity, demanding that their religion and only their religion enter public schools and public life, calling for tax dollars to fund their own private religious schools, etc. And that's before we get into all the racism at a bunch of these places. Mm. That's what the rank and file want to do. Just because they don't have the power of, say, Mike Johnson or someone or a platform like James Dobson, uh, doesn't mean we give them a free pass as good neighbors with bad ideas. And this is what he doesn't say anywhere in the piece. Oh, this is the part, this is also near the end. This is at the end. Speaking of those good evangelicals. Mm-hmm. I can't I, wait to meet him. I don't know whom these evangelicals will vote for in the 2024 election. Are you sure? Many of them will hold their nose and vote for Donald Trump. Perhaps some don't trust mask mandates or COVID-19 vaccines. Others might even attend churches that occasionally hold patriotic Sunday services. (laughs) But, but they are also doing the Lord's work. Oh my God, dude! This This is the inspirational music at the end of the movie part of his article. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> Are you sure this is real and not just somebody pranking me personally, me, Jessica, personally? I I'm can having tell a hard you. Time. I will tell you how the 2024 elections will go. Just like in 2016 and 2020, roughly 80% of white evangelicals will vote for Donald Trump because they did it twice, mm-hmm. give or take a percentage point or two. Mm-hmm. That is the clearest indication we have that all of those people failed the simplest moral test of our time. Mm. They chose as our nation's leader an unrepentant sex predator who doesn't take the job seriously and whose entire life flies in the face of their supposed values. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they're basically condemning as evil the Catholic devout guy Mm. who's fine despite the relevant and like righteous criticisms we can have of him. Mm -hmm. That guy's apparently the devil, um, and they'll well, vote mean, for Donald Trump. Like, that's what they're going to do. We know they're going to do that. And by the way, when they're they're not going to hold their nose and vote for Trump. Oh, my God. They're no. going to wear T-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. They're not like, no one says, well, fuck democracy. I guess I have to do it. Yeah, they're, you're making me. Have you driven through small town America? Because <laughs> I guarantee you those people are not holding their noses about literally anything. And this thing, maybe they don't trust mask mandates or COVID-19. Mask mandates. What do you think that means? That means they reject what actual people who study this stuff Who's have to talking say. talking about mask mandates? Oh, are they all still of them. mad? Yes. They think that was phase one and phase two will happen later and they're done with vaccines forever. And by the way, patriotic Sunday services that these good Christians Holy supposedly shit, that attend. one is genuinely the dog whistliest thing I have ever heard if of you, my entire life. If you are listening life. to this and you were close to YouTube, go look up Robert Jeffress, who is the past Baptist uh, Southern Baptist pastor in Texas, who runs one of the biggest mega churches in the country. They do a July 4th, like, Jesus stravaganza everything. It's like the most American patriotic patriotic like jesus bullshit ever and it's scary because they equate their version of christianity with being a good american citizen mm-hmm. and the implication of that is anyone who doesn't like sign on to both aspects of that are not just like they're not Christians, therefore they're condemned to hell. Mm. They're not real Americans either. Mm-hmm. So what is this patriotic Sunday services? Those are like cults like, membership. Uh, we're not talking about like your regular church and it has like red, white, and blue bunting across the front. <laughs> that is not what we no, are no, talking no. about. They if there's not a the monster two. truck, I will eat my hat. They have the paintings of like, here's George Washington crossing the Delaware. Here's mm-hmm. Jesus on the boat next to him. Uh-huh. That's how history goes. We have the picture. Mm-hmm. Like, oh boy! Why are you also, giving them any credibility? Those are not the good ones. And it's such an unforced error, too. Like, wh- why would you? You didn't have to bring that up. I would actually <laughs> love to speak to the um, the piece that he said. What did he say about like 
the Jesus and John Waynes of it all. Yeah, oh. they're supposed to be critical, but could you go back? Oh, what did sure. he say about that? What like, did he say about the book? Just like about like people being critical. Like he mentioned David Barton. He mentioned the Jesus I and mentioned John him, Wayne. but he said for oh, all their value, books such as Jesus and John Wayne as works of evangelical history are woefully flat and do not explain historically the story of my father and I imagine millions of other men and women who learn from Dobson how to le- love their family. So I would really love to sit with that for a moment, if you'd indulge me, because um, as I've mentioned the last few weeks, I so David Barton has long been a, a, a liar, a liar, somebody who I am like weirdly obsessed with. You know that fe- I know you know that feeling of like I just need to know everything this guy says because it's fucking unhinged. Um, again, I'm listening to is it getting Jesus Warren right? Throckmorton. Warren Throckmorton. Yep. It's outstanding. Also, he. I just, like, want to hang out with Warren Throckmorton. He just has such, like, <laughs> professorial vibes. Like, I just want to, like, have a scotch with him in front of a fire and have him tell me about American history. Um, but I, I think it's important to to uh, to kind of plant a flag o- around the David Bartons and with him saying, oh, yeah, well, sure, you need to be critical of things. The thing with David Barton is not that he is trying to, like, I don't know. I don't know what he thinks his goal is, but what he's doing is fully lying about the history of this country. And I just, it it is just proven time and time again, the things he asserts are just simply false and are just simply not substantiated. And again, the problem with that is not just that he's lying, it's that what does he do on a regular basis? He speaks to this rank and file white evangelicals who soak it all in as if he's telling them the truth. And he's lying to them. We know he's lying to them. Mm-hmm. Christians, some, know he's lying. Mm-hmm. And yet, pastors keep inviting this guy to speak to their people. And Those are the good ones, by the way. Politicians keep taking him seriously. Yes. And, and the. <sighs> The problem is the David Bartons of the world are not just one-off people. They are absolutely trying to get their vision of America everywhere, which is why David Barton works so closely in Texas because uh, they're the way the United States works or worked at, at some point is that basically Texas is such a big school system that and whatever books they decide to use in Texas tend to get used throughout much of the country for reasons I don't understand or care. Um, but... That means he is trying to erase so many things from our history so we don't understand why we think what we think and why things happen what they happen. And I don't think we have really been able to properly reckon with the fa- uh, with what was taken from us when they take our history. I... Um, just finished the book Killers of the Flower Moon um, and watched the movie, and I'd like to talk about it in the bonus... But I was reading it, and I found out that w- basically the first, and I'm a, I was a ballet dancer growing up, the first major prima ballerina um, was a Native American woman. It, there was a pair of Native American sisters in the early 20th century who just set the world on fire. And I started dancing ballet when I was three years old. I watched everything I could get my hands on, learned everything I could. Never once did I hear of these women. And what, what might... You know, it's a small thing, but what might somebody's life look like if they are, I don't know, a black ballerina or something like that? And hey, non-white people have been dominating this this sport. It, it it's it's taking something from a lot of people when you steal our history. The the Tulsa ma- massacre. It is taking something from the so black community. So when David community. Barton is lying, so when about David American Barton history. is making uh, assertions about bullshit, it hurts huge swaths of the country who are not evangelical. And I think that's something we should maybe focus on, of not just like them lifting up evangelicals, but trimming our history, culling our history of anybody who is critical of America or the Founding Fathers or Christianity. So there are... Or white people. (laughs) There are white evangelicals, of course there are, who do very good things. We could say that about every subgroup you can imagine, but the country as a whole is worse off whenever white evangelicals have enough power Mm -hmm. to influence society or make decisions for others. Much like it's impossible to tell the whole story of American history without centering it, around slavery, Mm -hmm. it is impossible to tell the whole story of modern evangelical Christianity, which is what Fia wants us to do, Mm -hmm. without centering it around the awful beliefs 
all of these evangelicals hold. Notice, I'm not even, I'm not mentioning Jesus here. I'm not mentioning the fact that that all that stuff is untrue because that part is almost irrelevant here. It's that the way they live out those beliefs hurts people. Like whatever positive traits they have doesn't make up for the harm they've caused. Mm. So Sarah Jones, who is a journalist for New York Magazine, she grew up in an evangelical uh, family. Her father was influenced by James Dobson. Here's what she said about John Fia's article, because she was also critical of it. Mm. She writes, in practice, because her father listened to Dobson, in practice, this meant corporal punishment, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Because I was homeschooled from my early childhood and had no extracurricular activities, my parents could not meaningfully ground me, but my father could spank me and shove me and threaten me with belts, and he did. I still have physical scars from his efforts at discipline. My parents didn't always follow Dobson's advice, but his books and broadcasts gave abuse a Christian uh, imprimatur. That doesn't prevent Jones from, like, admitting what all of us know. There are evangelicals who do good. They want to help people. But if we wanted to give a comprehensive accounting of their faith, it would not look pretty because the bottom line is that living out their faith means hurting the marginalized, which is what you said. And here's what Jones goes on to say. Most white evangelicals are Trump voters. Mm -hmm. Their church may run a food pantry and host Mike Flynn or someone like him the following week. Thea admits as much. Many of them will hold their nose and vote for Trump, he writes, adding others might even attend churches that occasionally hold patriotic Sunday services, but they are doing the Lord's work. Mm. A patriotic Sunday service is a vague euphemism. What does it mean to do the Lord's work for the needy and then vote for a champion of the wealthy? Mm -hmm. Surely the needy deserve better than Trump. And she's right. Wow, that is a solid piece of business. Yeah, when it comes down to it, if you say you love children, which is what they all say, Mm -hmm. they're doing it for the kids, that's why they're pro-life, but then they make it harder for gay couples to adopt, they demonize kids who are LGBTQ, they push for looser gun regulations so that mass shootings continue unabated, if they spread lies about vaccines, if they teach kids that all forms of sex or physical contact before marriage are inherently sinful... You're lying to yourself. Mm-hmm. You're not making things better for kids. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just really hard to. And it, the thing is, you see it just in the world when people get very defensive about the way they were raised. I mean, I think like everybody who's had kids or whatever has had that thing of like their parents being really defensive of like, well, we did this and you were fine. Like, <laughs> golly, like clock in on Facebook if somebody is like, mm, maybe we shouldn't hit small children and people are like um i was hit and i was fine and it's just like okay you were hit and you were fine great i mean you're arguing on facebook your life has taken a sad turn i am not arguing on facebook anymore <laughs> i've taken i'm actually kind of off social media for the most part good for me it's good uh kristen cobest <laughs> uh the author of jesus and john wayne also responded to this article and she wrote that you know despite um even though you mentioned this earlier, mm. the propaganda that is pushed by white evangelical Christians, I mean, they have so much of it. David Barton is one example so of, it, much of it. But they have their own media networks. They have Christian bookstores. They have Christian radio. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to live in a Christian bubble if you want to. Mm-hmm. And they're all propagating the same message about how the faith is good mm-hmm. and you are good if you believe what they believe now give us money. But what she writes, uh, this is Dume who wrote Jesus and John Wayne, she said books like hers became bestsellers because apparently a whole bunch of Christians identified with what she was saying. Oh, is that a popular book in the Christian It is not. I mean, it's a bestseller in its own right. Sure. But anecdotally, I'm sure, I I don't want to speak for her. I'm sure she would tell you this anecdotally. Plenty of Christians have said, yes, you've put into Mm. write, I mean, this is what any good author does. You've put into writing something I have had a feeling about but couldn't quite describe, Mm. and you've contextualized it. What she writes is Jesus and John Wayne and the making of biblical womanhood, which is the book written by another author, became bestsellers, not because a secular public couldn't get enough of evangelicals behaving badly. Mm -hmm. They became bestsellers because evangelical readers themselves found them and said, this is true. After decades of being fed only one narrative, Mm -hmm. all of the positive stories and celebrations of how they, more than anyone else, were doing the Lord's work, tens of thousands of evangelical readers found in our books accounts that resonated with their own experiences. Hmm. Thea's dad's story may not take center stage in my book, but other people's stories do. Hmm. 
which is true. I mean, it's ridiculously easy to find those positive portrayals of Christianity. Yeah, of course. Because that's the narrative Christians tell themselves. Yeah. They created their They've own the parallel machine. universes. Yeah, record labels, mm-hmm. movie studios, publishing outlets. They have all of that dedicated to perpetuating that propaganda. What they have a hard time doing is seeing themselves through the eyes of everyone outside their bubble. Mm-hmm. Like, they've refused to reckon with the consequences of their misguided and unhealthy beliefs they don't want to acknowledge how many of the rest of us just see them as like, you're weird freaks who have really weird beliefs. And it's not weird. It's not weird because you think differently because everyone thinks differently. It's that the things you believe in are objectively harmful. We can scientifically study what purity culture has done. Mm -hmm. It has harmed people. And it's all that, like, you think this is good and you celebrate how good you are. And I can tell you how many people have died of COVID because of your negligence. Truly. I can tell you how many people have grown up feeling sexually traumatized uh, later in life, even if they followed all your rules because Mm -hmm. of what you believe. Just because more people are now talking about those issues out loud, kudos to the many still evangelical women who have spoken out about the purity culture stuff, the Mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Just because they're speaking about that, confronting faith-based abuse doesn't mean we're getting a skewed image of evangelicalism. It just means we're now finally getting an accurate one Mm -hmm. that was suppressed for so long. Yeah. I mean, it's just, oh God, it's so wild because it, it truly feels like an alternate universe that everybody, that a lot of people are living in of like, uh, of these, uh, and I, you know what? I said this last week, so I'm not going to la- repeat it about like, we know who is molesting children. And like, they're more concerned about this hypothetical drag queen who is like coming over to like hoard over their families or whatever. They're more worried about that than like the people who we know for a fact are doing it and they're right. just covering that up. Like, it's. I mean, it's a as cult. we've talked about, there are state legislatures that want to say, hey, if you make a confession that you're a child abuser in the confessional booth or to a Mormon bishop, yeah, they should be obligated to tell the police about you. That and is... there are laws that are saying, yeah, make them mandated reporters like teachers. Mm. And who's fighting against that? Honestly, it's It's so religious people. Horrifying. That one is. That one feels as close to genuine evil as I can think of. Right. The idea that... And again, the are... argument they make is, well, we want to protect our faith and the rules of our faith. And it's so funny because I like to protect uh, children <laughs> and those who are disadvantaged. You wouldn't and it's understand really nice that because they are... you're not pro-life. Well, I'm really glad they're fighting so hard for somebody who died 2,000 years ago and also probably doesn't <laughs> every... give a shit about trans people, if and we're all being honest. everyone else, screw it. It just... Why? Why? <sighs> there is no difference, bottom line. Like, even he, John Fia said, like, we have to distinguish Christian nationalists, who he criticizes, too, with those conservative evangelicals who are like, what? They're normal. They just have different beliefs from you. Like, nah, they're, the Venn diagram there is, like, 90% overlapping. Well, and then if anybody is, like, Wiccan, they're like, oh, well, we know all about Wiccan. Uh, <laughs> they uh, haunt trees and cast spells on me personally. So bad. Like, they, they're they so obsessed with, like, hey, everybody, like, see me as a person first. But any other person in the entire universe, they're like, judgment, judgment, judgment. Like, it, they're miserable people. This is funny. This is from a commenter on my website. But they said, you know, just last week during the Super Bowl, there were two or there was a minute long ad for He Gets Us, which is the Christian ad campaign paid for by anonymous donors. But what we now know, oh. they are like right wing evangelical rich people. But to, uh, for one did minute, did Scientology have an ad too? I think they did. Nice. But a minute of airtime during the Super Bowl is roughly fourteen million dollars. And so the argument is that one, they fourteen million dollars could be used in many better ways. Oh, than so many ways. Trying to sell Jesus. Uh-huh. Two, um, the the commercial that aired showed Jesus doing kind things for people who Christians don't normally agree with. So you have people like washing the feet of like what, I don't remember what it was like washing the foot of a drag queen or something. I don't remember, but the argument, yeah, it's not happy. (laughs) The argument from a lot of Christians, conservative Christians who saw that ad, like I'm mad because it's 14 million of wasted dollars for what selling Jesus. As we've talked about before, you can't sell Jesus so 
embarrassing. without talking about the consequences of what that looks like in America, which is not good. And the other side is conservative Christians hated those commercials, too, because, as this writer says as in a comment, uh, evangelicals were angry because it didn't accurately portray them as terrible people. Because they were saying, oh, what, is, <laughs> what, Jesus washing the feet of people? No, no, no. Scared them. <laughs> Tell them why they're going to hell. Tell them gay people are bad. Oh, like, <laughs> outstanding. So Christians were mad at the commercials, too, for very different reasons. Yeah, why? Because the dum-dums. bottom line is the people trying to sell you this whitewashed version of Jesus, literally whitewashed version of Jesus. <laughs> Ooh, what did Jesus look like? Was he ripped? <laughs> he was ripped, he and he this, was... The, ve- he had the V-shape. The hip muscles? Yep. Yeah. Uh, he, he was very white, pale, pasty, white, blonde hair. From what, what I hear, hair. that's what the pictures show. That's impressive. Um, but they're mad because <laughs> even r- they know, even they know. No, if you want to portray Christianity, you got to be a jerk to the marginalized. Yeah. What are you doing? Making them show good things? Yeah. Wow. I'm, boy. Boy, oh boy. Good week boy, to oh be a boy. Christian. I don't even know what to say. Right. I just don't understand this like alternate universe people are living in that they're like... This is what bothers me whenever I read John Fia's articles because, again, I appreciate the criticism he has for the Trump wing of the Christian world, sure. and he has been critical of that. But at the same time, he's so deferential to what he thinks are good Christians, and mm-hmm. it's like, buddy, these are not good people either. Well, I don't care if you know them, and I don't care if you think they have a good heart, well, because I know what there, they do. Isn't I know there a sense do. of responsibility of, like, not just, I know your heart, and I know you, whatever, so I'm going to let this go, but, like, why isn't it, I know your heart, and you shouldn't be believing these things. I yeah. know your heart. You don't want to hurt people. But it's the this same is argument people. they make for the anti-abortion crowd. Like, these are not activists. They're good people who want to protect the innocent. It's yeah. like, no, they're literally trying to pass laws or fighting to mm-hmm. pass laws that hurt people. Yeah. Like, and again, we're just glossing over all of that. Like, those are not good people. I don't care if you say, no, I just have a religious objection to same-sex marriage. Yeah, because yeah, you're a bad person. It's yeah. not hard to say that. Yeah. There's no no good per- I mean, And granted, listen, there are people who take their time to evolve on this issue, Barack Obama being one of them. I know it takes a while to get there, but it's fair to criticize people who are there still. Yeah, it um, really like, is. Like, move along. Get with it. Well, and it's why if are you're still not there, Jesus? Well, why do why does this guy fight so hard to protect quote unquote these like again quote unquote innocent evangelicals? Because nothing is happening to them besides like I mean, the court you, of public opinion. Because he lives in a Christian bubble, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean he teaches at a Christian school. He's probably surrounded by really well intentioned students and colleagues who take their scholarship seriously, which is, I mean, fine. I get why you would want to be defensive right. of those people who you think are good people. But at the core, whatever their reasons for their beliefs, their beliefs harm a lot of people. And if you can't admit that, yeah, these people, if if your moral compass says, well, I got to vote for Trump, well, then your moral compass is broken. Mm-hmm. I don't care where it's coming from. I don't care yeah. if you say, well, it's because I'm a Christian. I'm a Bible believer. It's like, yeah, you're still a bad person. So you do the math. Um, I mean, I think also we need to take like a historical look at Christianity because... Oh, can I jump yeah. in really quick? Kristen Cobas dume said very clearly in her response to... He accused me of not showing, like, the history of evangelicalism. I'm paraphrasing here. This is Jesus here. and John Wayne? Yes. Okay. And she's like, I wasn't writing a history of evangelicalism. Yeah. I was writing about a specific a- uh, aspect of it. And also, she so. doesn't owe you shit, right. dude. <laughs> like, you don't have to justify your book. Go on. Um, I-, I just wanted to, like, kind of briefly take a historical look at how Christians have treated non-Christians. Because from what I can see throughout history, Christianity was all about, I don't care what you're doing. I care about why you're doing it. So you're doing good. You're Muslim. Who gives a shit? You're Christian now. You're Native American people. You guys have been doing fine for a thousand years. Fuck you. You're going to learn how to be Christian. History is littered with Christians killing entire civilizations in order to propagate Christianity. So this, to me, feels very... um, uh, disingenuous because like don't pretend that most Christians just want to live their life and do their thing and go to church on Sunday and yada 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 they don't that's Christianity is all about 
spreading Christianity. If so, you give non-religious people the amount of money and the kind of infrastructure truly. Uh, that churches had, yeah. they would be able to do a lot of the good stuff yeah. without... I mean, that's in theory what government <laughs> should be doing if they had a lot of the money to go along with it and the political will to yeah. do a lot of it. Well, and just it's just funny that this guy is saying, like, everybody's mean to people just because they're Christians when... The last 1,500 years has just been Christians wiping out civilizations just because they're not Christian. Again, I've just <laughs> just read and watched Killers of the Flower Moon, so my brain is very much in like Native American shit, but I cannot help but think of kidnapping Indian children and sending them off to get a good Christian upbringing. Catholics in Canada, that's... And by the way, in the US. they weren't trying to integrate the Native Americans mm. with white people. That was a later thing. They were just trying to destroy their culture and make them Christian. And then they could live their lives being Christian in the little plot of land that we we grant them because we're so generous. Like the idea that like oh, people are being mean for Christians and we're just trying to be nice. Look at history, dog. You can't because David Barton stole it from you. <laughs> asshole. Let's move on to a different story. <sighs> Jason Rapert. Again? Again, this one's amusing, though. This is a good news story. So Jason Rapert, as we've discussed many times, he's a Christian nationalist. He's one of the baddies um, (laughs) (laughs) who has served in various levels of power in Arkansas. He was a state senator for 12 years. He obviously pushed ultra conservative legislation while he was a state senator. He installed the Ten Commandments monument outside the Capitol. I don't think there I even still... know my state senator's name right now, <laughs> and I know this motherfucker. He he uh that Ten Commandments monument has legal challenges to this day. In 2022, he chose to give up his seat so he could run as uh for lieutenant, lieutenant governor. governor. And then he got crushed in the GOP primary. Haha, <laughs> God said no. Wait, was he running for lieutenant governor? He's running for governor. No, he was running he for would... lieutenant governor. It's a separate you position. Can you can do that in Arkansas. Mm, um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was going to be the governor GOP like primary choice. Yeah. Lieutenant governor wasn't as clear because outside of Arkansas, there's not much name recognition for those positions. So it's not the way president vice president is. They run on the right. ticket. It's, they did not run together. Oh, this is very like early anyway. American history. Yeah. Jefferson and Adams yeah. having to work together. So that's Jason Raper. Sure musical about After that. he lost in the the lieutenant governor's race in 2022 he basically went back to running a group he started called the National Association of Christian Lawmakers because that's what we don't have enough yeah, of finally. Christian lawmakers right yeah uh basically bringing together theocrats to i don't know listen to David Barton um <laughs> weenie (laughs) (laughs) but late last year like back in december of 2023 there was a he kind of returned to the political arena because sarah huckabee sanders now the governor of arkansas she appointed jason rapert to the arkansas state library board which is scary zoinks yeah uh, basically, it's an, a relatively unknown group, but they control some of the funding that goes to libraries across the state. It's a seven-member board. Huckabee Sanders, uh, she appointed two people. He was one of them. But the writing on the wall was clear. She's trying to put conservatives yeah. on that particular uh, group and what is because they aim? could fight their culture war battles and go What's against libraries. What's the point of that? Uh, to prevent kids from checking out books that have gay characters or anything sexual like, or anything. I- Listen, fun bit. It's adorable. Has that always been a thing, or is it a new... It's a newer thing to go after these it previously... Really it's non-pol- retaliatory. Yeah, it's okay. non-politicized groups, and they're saying, wait, there's a thing that's non-politicized? We're Republicans. Sure. Let us take it over. If there was a fire department oversight board, they would try to stack it with Republicans, and then shit would burn. Imagine if we pitched the concept of libraries to Republicans oh in the year of God. our Lord 2024. You socialist. I know. Can you imagine uh-huh. sharing knowledge? I hate it. <laughs> so the group meets every three months. The first meeting of this library board took place last week mm. uh, that Jason Raper was a part of anyway. And what was one of his first acts? Well, let me tell you. You need a little bit of background. Last year, uh, Arkansas passed a bill called Act 372 of 2023. Weird name. <laughs> Boring name. But basically what it does is it's an anti-library bill. It keeps oh, harmful content out of the hands of children. What counts as harmful content? Oh, boy. It was not if you give def- a mouse a cookie because yeah. it teaches communism. <laughs> it was never defined. It also punished librarians who then allowed kids to check out those books. So critics... Wait, literally punished? Yeah, literally punished. Um, so, like, what once a book was declared harmful, 
if a library allowed a kid to check out that book, the, you can go after the librarian. So critics rightly said that's censorship. A judge actually prevented the law from going into effect because wow. it violates every First censorship. Amendment, everything. <laughs> and there was a trial that's set to begin later this year. No. But there were 18 plaintiffs in the lawsuit to stop the law. And three of them included the Central Arkansas Library System, oh the Fayetteville Public Library, and the Eureka Springs Public Library. Three very large library systems are like, yeah, no, this is, this is censorship. Uh, you can't do this. So they filed a lawsuit against the state for passing this Sorry, bill. sorry, sorry. I thought and Republicans no. were all about small government and letting the will of the people do Unless the thing. Unless you're a and... woman or give a mouse a cookie. Oh. In which case, nope, they get to control who I gets. I see. You, you see my confusion, though, about uh, this uh, This uh, government shouldn't get involved in our, in our kids' are lives. Are you saying Republicans are illogical? I'm saying they're hypocritical. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of so, people, in addition, but that's not the point I was making so at what that did, moment. So what did Raper do? He <laughs> said, sure, sure, we got to give funding to all these libraries, sure. But, but, Unless. I, <laughs> I would like to make a motion that we not give money to those three library systems because they're fighting this bill and, like, you know, the trial hasn't concluded. Is he a six-year-old pitching, picking his dodgeball team? Mentally, yes. Like, genuinely, he's like, you were mean to me, so you don't get government money for uh-huh. your government institution because you hurt my fifis. Yes. So the good news here is he made that motion. He's like, why don't we just not give them money? And everybody was lawsuit. like, good job, Jason. This is the kind <laughs> of common sense governance we've been looking for. <laughs> All six other members of the board, including the other person Sarah Huckabee Sanders appointed alongside Jason Rapert, all six of them said... No, dog. So I said no to him. <laughs> they didn't second the motion. no from yeah, dog. <laughs> everyone across the line is like, the hell are you doing? What did he say? I want to see a video of it. He said... Do you have a video of it? No, there's been no oh, video. He it. said, we're basically, we're, we basically are just writing a check to their attorneys for the litigation. I'm simply saying that most anyone in here would find it objectionable. Board member Pam Meredith of Cherokee Village said she opposed Rapert's motion. Thanks, Pam. If we did withhold funds... That would not only hurt the library as a building or as an agency, but it would hurt the entire community. Additionally, we would be taking a political stand, and I don't believe that is our cause here. Damn. Uh, he couldn't get it done in Arkansas. <laughs> he couldn't get it done with the six Arkansas. other people on the library. Yeah. Eventually, the board, after they said, yeah, no, we don't support the motion. We're moving forward with giving all the libraries what they need from us. Yeah. After they're like, yeah, no to your motion, <laughs> all seven of them, Rapert included, because he knew he had been defeated, they unanimously said, fine, give him all the funding. So they beat him down and got him to vote to give them library funding. All and around. I love that. That's it- over $200,000 to those three systems in particular. I just love that it was just some gal named Pam who's like, dude. <laughs> and not even like a whole political grandstand of like, hey, actually. And We're honestly, gonna I think we need more and... Pams in the world. God, oh, help me if she turns out to be a horrible transphobic bigot. <laughs> but the Pams of the world heard is like, oh, actually, no. You're, I, I, listen, I hear you and I see you. That's not what this is. <laughs> <laughs> but have fun with whatever that is. Yeah. Like, so it. This isn't the place, son. <laughs> so they're giving them the I money. I she called him son <laughs> in a <laughs> really condescending nice. way. So it's good news for the library since they provide all kinds of important services for communities and withholding any funding that they need amounts to punishing the people who use those services the most. Mm. Rapert isn't going to stop here. He's hell bent on making sure kids don't read books that discuss sex, LGBTQ, anything, mm. anything he deems mature. But the way the Arkansas law is written, if the judge doesn't stop it like the way for librarians to avoid punishment would be taking all those books deemed harmful out of reach of kids and theoretically out of the reach of adults too because you could put it in an adult only section but a kid might still read it um none of that bothered him he's he said such a bad person he's so bad rapert claimed the books he finds objectionable are quote targeting and lying to children we have people that say we don't know whether we're little girls or little boys. That's a lie, he said. We have people that say it's okay to have books about rape and explicit sex in front of young children. That's a lie. Oh. He doesn't know what a lie is. But also, yeah, it's a part of life that is an unfortunate tragedy. And if those are mentioned in books, whether it's a memoir or a scene in a novel or something, talking about it 
and letting kids read books that expose them to those sorts of incidents, that is important. Sometimes mm-hmm. for understanding what may have happened to them. It, it truly... Uh... And by the way, if you want to get rid of books that have depictions of rape and sex, then no, get the rid Bible of the thing. Bible. Don't do the Bible thing. Sorry, it's, it's stupid. It's, it's so easy. hacky. We're better than that, We are not better We're professionals. <laughs> I just, it's just so embarrassing. It's all so fucking embarrassing. And like, and I also would love for Jason Raper to like flash back to his adolescent self and think about like, if an adult tells you you're not supposed to read a thing, does that make you want to read it less or more? <laughs> like, yeah. what the fuck are you? T- it's so If it's you want people to read banned books, call them a, every author would sign up. To say, yeah, ban my book, please. I have a side question. Is Jason Rapert very wealthy? Like, how does he fund all of these campaigns I don't know that, that he's, he's wealthy. doing? I mean, once you're an incumbent, and again, running for state legislature not does not take millions expensive. of dollars. Um, once you're there, incumbency helps. And if you're in a red district, someone like him would be just fine. Like, I'm just wondering if and I could be... And once you're running for higher office, now you have donations. Coming. I'm just wondering if there's another universe where I can be a, like, liberal Jason Rayford in Illinois. Although we don't really need it. It's there a pretty are a liberal couple, state. And they, there are. They're awesome. But just in terms of, like... In my career, I don't actually do anything. I just yell a lot, and people talk about me on podcasts, and I somehow make a lot of money. I would like <laughs> ah. that job, please, Jason. Could I yeah. Could I just tap into Well, when that? you tap into an argument that Christians are being persecuted, and you're leading the charge to stop them from being persecuted. Leading there feels are, generous. There are a lot of people who will throw money at that cause yeah. because they are good Christians who just mm. want to bear their beliefs on public life. Hmm. Uh, so later in that same meeting with the library people, Jason Raper then asked, uh, can all libraries be surveyed to see if they possess certain objectionable books? To which one of the, the librarian in charge of this board is like, yeah, fine. We can ask them if they have the books because that's not actually a weird request. Because we're not saying you do anything about it. Well, Then they might take a different stance. But... I mean, literally, what did this they is, think was going to happen? I don't know. But it's like, if you wanted me to run the computer code that says, does the c- library own yeah. this book? We can do that. It's fine. It's, I mean, honestly, he could have done that by himself on like Libby. He could have. <laughs> um, so they haven't voted on I just it. made myself laugh so hard. By the, on his list, he offered a list of some objectionable books. They included Gender Queer and This Book is Gay. Which are two popular books? I think young adults. I mean, is oh god, books. is it illegal for books to be gay too? It is. Oh, I hate um, to hear the that. The Arkansas Times noted Justice that Jason Rapert quote chose to focus on books with LGBTQ plus themes and not those with extreme violence or steamy heterosexual sex scenes. <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, because he we know what his uh, who he sees as the and problem. And truly, isn't that the other thing that we haven't been talking about? Is is Rapert? at all are trying to get rid of like anything that even suggests that gender isn't a binary, but they're like, oh, uh, Fight Club where it literally gives you instructions <laughs> right. on how to build a bomb. Yeah, that's fine. No notes. There you go. Great. Uh, my fear here Honestly, is... Honestly, people should read Fight Club because it's a satire and people are too fucking <laughs> stupid to understand it. Um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, now that this has happened, my fear is that when she has the next opportunity to appoint people, she'll just go even more political into it. Because now that she knows, oh, we could have done more here, I'm just going to keep appointing. It's oh, like Republicans with the Supreme Court. Like, let me just find the craziest, right. least qualified people among the set of people like who could be in this job. Let me find the people who align with my politics and put them here. Why, why would you appoint a librarian to the library board? Let me find a right-wing politician and just say, hey, you're in charge of libraries now. Go. I was just thinking about the people sitting on the Supreme Court and just getting quietly angry. Oh, yeah. You, you oh can always God. do that. I hate it so much. I hate everything. Shall we move on? Can it be a good thing? I'm really feeling beaten down now. No. God. So, um, <laughs> no, let's talk about this. <laughs> Last week, uh, there's an atheist, Joseph Richardson, who's fantastic. He lives in Florida. He's part of the Central Florida Free Thought community. And last Ooh, week he Central was... Central Florida. Like they're that awesome. World. I love their group. They were slated to... They One of the things that that group has done is after the Supreme Court said you're allowed to have invocations at local government meetings, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they said, all right, if they're going to open the door to religious invocations, we are going to make sure members of our group are in that mix. So every community, every town that they have 
members in, they've said file to give an invocation there. They've given, I think, well over 100 Mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. So last week, Joseph Richardson was slated to deliver an invocation at a meeting of the Tavares City Council Mm -hmm. in Florida. And I listened to his invocation. It was fantastic. He talked about, it was like a minute long. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, I urge you all to unite in the spirit of reason, compassion, and the pursuit of justice. Mm -hmm. He reminded everyone that their actions were, quote, guided by the principles of inclusivity, fairness, and respect for the autonomy of every individual. Mm. It was perfectly fine. Perfectly non-offensive. And then this is what was interesting. If you watch the video of this invocation, as soon as he was done, the city council said, all right, thank you, Joseph. All right, Phil, you're next. Phil, go get up there. Phil is the city's utilities director. (laughs) His name is Phil Clark. Classic Phil. Classic Phil. And he just gets up to the mic all of a sudden. It's not public comments time. He just gets up there and delivers a second invocation. Oh, and is it the same or different? It is different. What? His speech referenced Heavenly Father Mm. and asked God to, quote, forgive us for our sins in Jesus Christ's name. So basically, they saw Joseph's name on the agenda and they're like, hey, Phil, we need you to uh, give the correct invocation after the atheist is done. They didn't put this in the agenda. You don't see Phil's name in the agenda. Nope. They just had that one ready to go. And what Phil just had a speech ready to go on a whim, apparently. Like, as if it wasn't pre-planned. This feels a lot like when I gave a talk to an atheist group and the guy who went right next to me was like, sure hope she doesn't ac- accuse me of mansplaining and my <laughs> head exploded and I'm still mad about it. That's what this feels like. That's really yeah. pulling up some particular feelings I have. And what's even more, maybe not surprising, is that this is not the first time this has happened to Joseph Richardson specifically. Oh. This is the fourth time one of his invocations has been followed up by a Christian invocation as if to serve as a Band-Aid for the harm he just caused. I'm trying to think of a single other example where something like this could possibly be, like, appropriate or a thing that could even happen. It's like if at the Oscars, somebody won Best Picture and somebody else is like... Actually, that Jesus and John Wayne movie was really good. Or, like, I truly... It's just... Oh, boy, yeah, we need to make dumbs. up for the problem. By the way, it, this and is like, not in the list. What are you worried that's going to happen? Is like the building going to get sucked into hell if somebody doesn't like say Heavenly Father once that's, a week? That's the question. I mean, a similar corrective measure, corrective if you will, measure! occurred in Arizona in the Arizona legislature in 2017 when Athena Salmon, uh, a state representative, she gave a secular invocation. And then one of her colleagues requested and received permission to deliver a Christian one right after that. I remember that. And in 2019, after Joseph Richardson gave a secular invocation, the mayor literally apologized on Mike afterwards saying, this is something that was brought to us to do, not that we do it. Like, atheist invocations do not need a Jesus-infested do-over. They're such babies. Such babies. Like, they're truly, like, when I watch my my toddler niece, if I do something, she gets mad, and then I have to let her do the thing, too. And she's almost four. (laughs) So now... She also got mad at me for singing along with Encanto because I ruined the entire movie for her. This is how these people sound to me. So. Of like, you said the wrong words, now the whole thing is ruined, we can't even do it. We have to, re- <laughs> true story, rewatch the song so I don't sing and ruin it. That is what these people are doing. Find a difference. Find a difference between, um, you did it bad, we have to do it again, good. Yes. Four-year-old niece. Yes. Not even four. So and now, I like her more than I like In a letter people. to that city council, the Tavera City Council, the Freedom From Religion Foundation's you attorney, really Chris good voice. I was not ruining the song. Uh, you would have ruined the song. <laughs> Attorney Chris Lyon is calling their actions discriminatory and unconstitutional, and he writes to say, we ask that the council immediately apologize to Joseph and ensure that the discriminatory conduct exhibited at this meeting does not recur. If you can't treat invocation speakers equally, instead favoring Christianity and denigrating nonbelievers, the practice of having an invocation needs to be eliminated entirely. Mm. FFRF has also requested public records Involving, like, basically, send us everything you got between council members and Phil Clark, the utilities guy. <laughs> like, how soon 
How soon were you planning this? We want to know. Phil. We want to know what your emails look like between this because there might be some juicy stuff in there. In my heart, Phil is just a pawn in all of this. He's just a simple <laughs> utilities man who loves Jesus and loves yeah. utilities. He's one of the good Christians, <laughs> He's you one see. Of the good um, David Williamson, who is the co-founder of this uh, Central Florida group, he basically told me it was a clear pattern of discrimination against Joseph. And he oh, said, we intend to be at the next meeting to speak during public comment and express our great concerns for this practice and mm. request an apology. And he echoed, like, to treat non-theists differently than others who provide an invocation is clearly discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see what happens after that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I just, they can't let the tiniest things slide, Seriously. can All they? you have to do is just move on, you do your job. You just have to be cool for a fucking second, yeah. and they just fail that marshmallow test over and over, <laughs> don't they? I got one last story All for right, you here. Let's hear it. And this is about Jerry Newcomb. He is the executive director of a group called the Providence Forum, which is an outreach of D. James Kennedy Ministries. And he's very upset, Jerry is. Jerry is very upset because he wrote in an essay for the Christian Post, he's very bothered that the right-wing group Moms for Liberty uh -oh. has basically been declared a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has tracked this sort of thing for decades. Here's what he says. The Southern Poverty Law Center, a group that claims to be the last word on who are haters and hate groups in America, has now added Moms for Liberty to their infamous map of hate. This means, according to the SBLC, that right up there, or really right down there, that, with the skin like in hell. with the skinheads and the KKK, is this grassroots organization of mothers concerned about their children's education. According to the SPLC, if they are parents with a conservative point of view, then they are bigots. Skinheads? We're still worried about skinheads? We're skin still heads? apparently worried about them. Are we worried about street toughs, too? <laughs> yes. Anyone with a bandana <laughs> on the street. Yeah. Where they have their cigarettes rolled up in their t-shirt sleeves. Oh, yeah. And basically, because this guy is a conservative Christian minister, you should just assume... He's lying until proven otherwise. Yep. That's my default. Sure. And it turns out, hey, guess what? In this case, the skepticism is all warranted. So let's go through some of the lies he's telling. Let's do. He said that his ministry that he works with, the D. James Kennedy Ministries, he says the SPLC declared us a hate group because, quote, we disagree with same-sex marriage. Disagree which agree <laughs> with. What do you, when they say we disagree with same-sex marriage, it is such a fun little way to put that. This we the disagree. John Fia thing. These are just good Christians who disagree. Disagree with same sex marriage, and therefore we're going to use our considerable political capital to fuck over people who just want to get like a tax break and get married <laughs> and like simplify their taxes and buy a house together. So here's the thing. So S the Southern Poverty Law Center, which, by the way, I'll say this up front. There are reasons you could criticize the SPLC. There have been articles yeah. legitimately criticizing their fundraising methods, the way they've used their money in the past. Fine. It, we it, can criticize it. Yeah. But when it comes to the hate groups thing, I feel like whenever I read articles from these conservative Christian groups complaining about the SPLC, it's always the narrative is always they just say these groups are hate groups and right. leave it at just that. Because just because we believe X, we, are, we don't. Yeah. Yeah, because we believe X. And if you actually go to their website, one, they don't do that because then every evangelical church would be on the list, and mm. they are not. Mm. The second thing is they actually document, here is why we are calling them a hate group, because it's not a difference of beliefs. So I looked up their article uh, yeah, love to hear during it. which the D. James Kennedy Ministries, it used to be called Coral Ridge Ministries at the time. Um, here's what they said about Coral Ridge Ministries and D. James Kennedy, the dude who is now dead. Over the years, this is from the SPLC, over the years, Kennedy emphasized anti-gay rhetoric, particularly in his TV ministry. Mm -hmm. He recommended as essential the virulent work of R.J. Rush Dooney, who believed practicing gays should be executed. In an especially nasty 1989 edition of a Coral Ridge Ministry newsletter, Kennedy ran photographs of children along with the tagline, Sex with Children? Homosexuals say yes. Woof. Yeah. 
Even after new leadership took over the group, the group continued its bigoted ways by hiring an anti-gay activist named Robert Knight, which, all right, whatever, you can hire who you want, except, Bobby according Knight to the... From, uh, different from dude, Different dude. <laughs> except yeah. the SPLC said Knight wrote in 2002 that gay marriage, quote, entices children to experiment with homosexuality and that accepting homosexuality leads to, quote, a loss of stability in communities with a rise in crime, sexually transmitted diseases, and other social pathologies. Still another is a sword shortage of employable, stable people. Employable. That's the, that's the new guy they hired at the time. So again, this is not a disagreement about same-sex marriage. Those are blatant lies that this organization, this Christian ministry, spread about gay people, that gay people deserve death, yeah. that they are pedophiles. Yeah. That, was the ministry, that was the message this ministry was sending out to supporters. Mm. So I repeat, they were declared a hate group not because the SBLC didn't like them, not because they had a difference of opinion on marriage equality. It's because they were promoting this harmful false propaganda. All the SPLC did is highlight all of that with citations mm. and said, this is why they are, we are calling them a hate group. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that comes with consequences because if you are known as a hate group, maybe you don't get access to like Amazon promotions or stuff like that. That has happened in the past. Oh. So that's the reason they don't like it. It's not because some liberal group doesn't like us. It's because, yeah. oh, we were trying to fundraise off of Amazon. Right. And they said, no, we don't work with hate groups. Or Charity Navigator highlighted mm, who sure. was declared a hate group. And they didn't like that they were being punished that way. So anyway, this is why his ministry was declared a hate group. So what about Moms for Liberty? Uh, the article's oh, yeah. headline is Moms for Liberty, Now a Hate Group? Newcomb writes... Really compelling <laughs> headline. I that know. question mark sells papes. Yeah. Newcomb says that according to the SPLC, if they are parents with a conservative point of view, they are bigots. That's not true because there are plenty of conservative groups that don't make the list. If uh, every white right-wing group was on the list, there would be no reason to take it seriously. So I looked up the Moms for Liberty page mm -hmm. on SPLC. First of all, they're not listed as anti-gay. They're listed as anti-government, so it's a different category. Oh. But here's how they are summarized by the SPLC. They also use their multiple social media platforms to target teachers and school officials, advocate for the abolition of the Department of Education, advance a conspiracy propaganda, and spread hateful imagery and rhetoric against the LGBTQ community. Specifically, on the subject of LGBTQ people. Moms for Liberty has demonized trans children. They've called allies groomers, suggesting pedophilic intent. One leader suggested moving LGBTQ students to separate classrooms, kind of like we do with students with special needs. Woof. They reject trans identity, period, yeah. referring to it as a mental health disorder that is being normalized by predators. And they don't believe in mental health, so... Oh, of course not. And of course, they've gone after groups that support LGBTQ youth, including companies like Disney that they claim are, quote, okay with sexualizing our children. So this is not a difference of opinion. This huh. is harmful propaganda, lies that have no basis in the facts. That's why they're a hate group, while a pastor who just believes homosexuality is a sin or that God declares there are only two genders, mm. that does not make the list. It doesn't make the list. Moms for Liberty, however, goes well beyond that. Well, and by the way, if you go to their page on the SPLC's website, it's actually way more detailed about their other beliefs, too. The point is, there is a simple, straightforward case you could make as to why that group belongs on any hateful, uh, on any hate group list. Uh -huh. Newcomb didn't mention any of that stuff in his article. He also has nothing to say about the sex scandal involving the group's founders and Liberty, which, oh, man... Like the mom who helped start Moms for Liberty uh, was having threesomes with someone else who says she and her husband sexually assaulted her. Jesus. Oh, it's bad. Holy shit. Their I nickname. watched a movie about that. Yeah. Lifetime. <laughs> uh, Moms for Threesomes is now the new name Aww. in liberal press. It's it sounds great. like she didn't enjoy her threesome. I mean, I, I don't. She, listen, that's the I thing. hope she wasn't sexually I assaulted. Don't, I don't care horrible. what they do in their private life. Truly, it's I don't. It's the fact that they go after liberals for supposedly promoting whatever their church says is not God-sanctioned. Yeah. Like, that's the problem. And, of course, they're allegedly sexually assaulting their other partner. Oh, um, yeah, so, yeah, now, yeah. so now, what is this dude, Newcomb, what's he doing? He is basically doing what he's always done. He's lying to Christians 
in the hopes they'll never dig into the reality of anything he's saying. The Christian Post already fell for it. So the bottom line is that the leader of a Christian hate group is claiming that another Christian hate group is not a hate group. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just full circle. None of these people can reckon with the consequences of what they are doing. And truly, the consequences that they're included on a list, which is going to harm their funding, it's not like they're being, like, fucking firebombed, because that's... right. That's the Christian nationalist way to that do happens things. to abortion clinics yeah. and places like to that. save lives. Yeah, murder doctors. Wow, that was a big, strong bummer that we uh, we parked ourselves on. Eh? <laughs> do you have anything to pull no. us out of this pit? No, of course I don't. Was that it? That was it. Oh. I figured that first story would take a while, and it yeah, did. yeah, and it did. It was a good story. I liked it a whole yeah. lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't have a ton to talk about. We're getting a couple new horses, and I'm going to need help uh, naming. I'm just going to say it on this. <laughs> We're getting two ponies, and their previ- it's a boy and a girl, and their their previous current owner named them Marilyn and Monroe. Oh, my God. And I just can't, though. <laughs> and yeah. also, we, there's a woman named Marilyn who works at our bar or comes to our barn a lot, so like we're going to rename one. So if anybody has a good lady pony name for somebody to pair with Monroe, Anyway, that's... And we'll also talk about the Super Bowl. I did not watch the Super yeah. Bowl. You have to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can reach us. Uh, go to pa- You can oh, support yeah, this show by going to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast. Uh, you can also uh, sign up for our Discord or our Facebook page. Those links are in the show notes. Mm-hmm. And please leave a review yeah. on iTunes. Leave a review on iTunes just like... Wait for yes, it. My yes, phone this is better frozen. Be good. This it doesn't better matter. Be My good. phone is just completely I'll frozen. I'll read you the review anyway. It said we're the best. The best. And we love Jessica, even though she swears too much. And I think she's a little annoying, but I think people should give her a break. Done. All right. We'll see Five you stars. next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>